Hello, my name is Alexey Kuzmin. I'm uh, from Moscow, Russia. I'm an evaluation consultant and I'm doing evaluation for 22 years. This year I was invited by, by an international organization to speak at their conference about evaluation use. It was in the beginning of the year, but I'm still thinking about it. And that is why I, I'm going to make another short presentation of that topic. I'd like to say that I'm going to ask some challenging questions, not because I hate evaluation, but because I like evaluation, because I think evaluation is and should be useful and I also believe that evaluation should be fun. So the topic of my presentation is use of evaluation results, any chance to improve? Uh, the first question I would like to address is, do we have a problem with the evaluation use? Let's start with this interesting uh, uh, picture, which, is, uh, uh, which was developed by Marvin Alking recently, and it's called the evaluation theory tree. And when you look at this tree, you can see that there are three major branches in evaluation theory. And one of those branches is use, use of evaluation. Research on evaluation use started in the late 60s, early 70s, last century. And it started not only because evaluators are so concerned about use, but they, were, they got concerned about use because they found out in the late 60s, last century, that evaluations were not that useful. So they started research. And uh, research resulted in some outstanding, interesting publications that helped to enhance e evaluation use. For example, the um, first publication, uh, first edition of the Utilization Focused Evaluation book by Michael Quinn Patton uh, um, appeared in 1978. And of course, utilization-focused program evaluation is evaluation done for and with specific intended primary users for specific intended users. Basically, what it says is that if there is no people who are interested in the evaluation results, those results will not be used. It's like common sense. It also says that if there are some people who say that they want to conduct evaluation and have evaluation results, but cannot explain how they are going to use them. This is also a risky situation in the terms of the use of evaluation results. So, that publication appeared in 1978. There were more publications by the thought leaders in the evaluation area. Let's, um, and let's, uh, let's look what, what, let's see what, what happened 20 years later. Uh, another thought leader, Carol Weiss, in 1998, she said, speaking about evaluation use, we have not solved the problem, but we are thinking about it in more interesting ways. So, problem not solved. First of all, problem exists. Second, it's not solved yet. 1998. Now, 2018, Patricia Rogers publishes a, an article, Seven Strategies on enhancing evaluation. And her article is based on, on a session she conducted last year at the American Evaluation Association Conference. That session was very well attended. I was there. And uh, Patricia talks about what can be done to support the use of evaluation. How can evaluators, evaluation managers, and others involved or affected in or affected by evaluation support the constructive use of findings and evaluation processes? So the questions still exist. You know, strategy number one that Patricia proposes is uh, identify intended users and intended use early on. Didn't we know that from Michael Patton's early publications? Yes, we did. But the thought leaders still have to repeat that for some reason. So, I think we do have a problem. And, uh, of course, it exists since the early times. Research on evaluation use is an essential part of research on evaluation, and there are numerous important research findings that can inform evaluation practice and enhance evaluation use, but we haven't solved the problem yet. Why? First question, the next question would be, do we conduct evaluation when it is really needed? And uh, I would say that these days there are many organizations for which evaluation became a routine. 
program directors, program managers, project managers, they know that they simply, at some point in time, they have an obligation to conduct an evaluation. And uh, according to my experience, when evaluation becomes an inevitable routine, we face a problem with evaluation use. Because in many cases, under such circumstances, when people simply have to conduct evaluation, the motivation of the potential users is to minimize evaluation consequences or to avoid them completely. Um, next question is, do we consider evaluation a service? Like, we are here to help. Um, some people respond to this positively. Many people told me, yes, Alexei, evaluation is a service. If so, then we have a lot of sources to, uh, to, le to learn more about how to make evaluation more useful. There are a lot of books, a lot of publications on customer service, and just listen for several interesting thoughts. I'm going to quote some customer service gurus. If you are not serving the customer, your job is to be serving someone who is. Know what your customers want most and what your company does best, focused on where those two meet. The customer's perception is your reality. Isn't it interesting? Just think about it in the terms of evaluation. The customer's perception is your reality. The next one is my favorite. You are serving a customer, not a life sentence. Learn how to enjoy your work. That's why I think evaluation should be fun and is fun. Your most unhappy customers are your greatest source of learning. Very, very interesting stuff. And uh, there is a lot over there. Interestingly enough, I attended about 20 conferences uh, of the American Evaluation Association. And um, I have never seen a workshop, pre-conference or post-conference workshop, on customer service. Never. Why? I don't know. So, I believe that evaluation could be seen as service. Customer service professionals know how to make service useful. We can learn from them, definitely. Now, do we believe that evaluation is consulting? What is consulting about? There are wonderful uh, plenty of books on consulting, indeed. One of the most famous books was written by Peter Block. It's called Flawless Consulting. And Block says that consultant is a person in a position to have some influence over an individual, a group, of, or an organization, but who has no direct power to make changes or implement programs. Does it sound like a evaluator? Absolutely. So, consulting is about helping others, improving situation, problem solving, using special knowledge and skills, partnership, collaboration, no direct power to make changes, indirect influence. This is what consulting is about. Of course, it sounds pretty much like evaluation. One of the basic questions in consulting is how to get your knowledge, skills, experience, and personal energy used to help others when you have no direct power to make changes. Now, let's look at consulting process and compare it with evaluation process. Consulting process stages, according to Peter Block, are entry and contracting data collection and diagnosis, feedback and the decision to act, implementation, and finally extension, recycle, or termination. Stages of consulting process, of, oh, sorry, of evaluation process, negotiating scope of work, planning data collection analysis, pretty similar, feedback, yeah, and that's all, folks. Game is over. Nothing else. I mean, this is the end of it. So, the question is, is evaluation an unfinished consulting? Shall we consider that? Shall we go beyond feedback? Shall we do something else for our clients? Can we do that? Do we have proper skills? Uh, of course, there are interesting publications on the consultant roles. For instance, Edgar Schein describes three possible roles for consultants. Consultants as sources of information, consultants as doctors, and consultants as helpers or therapists. Interesting stuff. We can learn from that a lot. So, evaluation could be seen as consulting. We can improve consulting skills to make it more useful. And uh, how about going beyond recommendations? Um, use when. Uh, all of us know that the cost of design changes grows towards the closure of the program. 
So the earlier we make our decisions regarding design changes, the less money we'll waste on that. And uh, we, we also know that the further we go in the program or project cycle, the more we know about the program beneficiaries, their problems and how things work, and the less importance the decisions we can make about the program are. So, according to our experience, the most useful evaluations we conducted were informing program design. If we conduct evaluation at the very, very earliest stage or even prior to the program implementation, then it's uh, almost always could be used. Another interesting issue is um, uh, adaptive programs. These days, programs are getting more and more flexible and adaptive because they operate in a very complex and dynamic environment and they have to be adaptive. So, uh, uh, when, when the program design is adaptive, it means that you design the intervention, you probe, then you evaluate, and then again you design, you probe, evaluate, etc. So these cycles repeat and repeat and repeat. And of course, under such circumstances, something like traditional midterm evaluation or like final evaluation will not be very useful. Evaluation under such circumstances should be developmental or adaptive. And this term was indeed uh, proposed by Michael Quinn Patton, who wrote a book on developmental evaluation. So uh, I also think that um, for implementing developmenting, developmental or adaptive evaluation, it's really important to develop self-evaluation capacity in organizations, evaluation capacity of all the people who are involved in the program implementation, because if you wish to have an ongoing evaluation process, you cannot rely on the external consultants. You have to be doing that yourselves. Uh, evaluation should be timely to be useful indeed. Evaluation that informs program design has high utilization potential. And I believe that only adaptive developmental evaluation can be really useful for adaptive programs. And that requires uh, development of uh, evaluation capacity in organization. What about evaluation reports? Two things. First, I believe that and there is some evidence already, some research is done on that, that reports that look pretty much like academic uh, publications are not very useful. And uh, the trend is to use infographics and stuff like that to make um, uh, the evaluation outcomes user-friendly and easier to grasp. This is first thing. The second thing is about publication of evaluation reports. Imagine a, a, an external consultant who is invited to conduct a program evaluation and he is told, uh, please conduct this evaluation and tell us both good news and bad news if you find any about the program. Uh, and we, we hope to get your open and honest feedback. And, and when you write that report, we are going to publish it. By saying that you are creating a potential conflict of interest for the consultant. And of course, what, what the conflict of interest is, it's simple. Uh, our, our basic rule is do no harm to your client. But if I want to, to, be, to be honest and professional, if, if I want to provide all kind of feedback and, and show program as it is, uh, it, could very, it could happen that, that uh, I will share some bad news with people. And if they want to publish that, it could, it could it can become harmful to the organization. So under such circumstances, in accordance to uh, the consultant's ethical rules, I have to refuse to do evaluation, all right? Um, most people don't, but, and, and they negotiate and they say, you have to choose whether or not you're going to, to publish this, but I'm, I'm going to write whatever I found out and it could be harmful. You need to consider that. Okay, people say, okay, do it. And then, then, in the end of the evaluation process, it creates unnecessary tension between consultants and the intended users, because the intended users start fighting about wording, about concepts, etc., etc. Why? Because it's going to be published. Even if they agree, they don't like those th things to be published. So, 
we shouldn't publish evaluation reports. Full text evaluation reports should not be published. And the solution is, if there is something that is really interesting, that could be interesting for the broader audience, why don't you publish an article? Why don't you make a presentation at the conference and joint presentations of evaluators and evaluation intended users are most interesting from, from my point of view. Publish articles, not reports. Um, and um, of course, it's related to rethinking reporting guidelines and standards for evaluators. I understand this is a challenge, but maybe it's time to talk about that. Uh, why do they resist? By them, I mean those strange people who still cannot fully appreciate our really useful uh, services, I mean, by which I mean evaluation. Um, so, um, what's important here is that resistance is natural. Uh, people, organizations, systems resist to change. And I'd like to, to remind you of the Glacier's formula that was developed by one of the organization development people in the mid-60s, by the way, at the time when evaluation use research started. The formula says that in order to overcome resistance, which is natural for systems and people and organizations, you have to have three factors. You have to have dissatisfaction with the as-is state, state you have to have a vision of possible to be state and you have to have uh, first steps clear plan what you're going to do next then you can overcome resistance if you don't have at least one of those factors it's not going to fly evaluation cont contributes to some extent to to this possible uh, dissatisfaction with as is and to the vision but in most cases, it really doesn't contribute to the future steps. So I think the solution here is collaboration between the evaluators and intended users, because if they, if they get involved in the process, as uh, Michael Patton describes in his book, they, they will own it. And of course, they are in charge of developing plans and next steps, etc. So we have to consider uh, resistance to change in all the cases. Uh, does it depend on the evaluation approach? Uh, yes, of course. Let me give you one example. Uh, it was a private foundation that supported creation of an opera. People sang and it was beautiful music. Um, and, um, and this foundation was uh, established by a person who is a businessman uh, and uh, who is used to um, KPIs. So he said, now I want to know if this opera is a high quality piece of art. Please develop KPIs for the opera. And people working for, for the foundation struggled with that for a while and failed. Well, it's a pretty tough task, isn't it? But the question is whether or not they chose the right approach. Maybe there are some other approaches that could make their approach to uh, their, their, their effort, evaluation efforts more, more effective. And of course they are, because if we consider that there could be expert evaluation when the judgment is based on the opinion of very knowledgeable people, if there is indicator evaluation where the opinion is based on the values of indicators, and empirical evaluation where, where we base our opinion on the empirical data collected in the course of evaluation, we can choose from the three. In this case, they were pushing hard the indicator evaluation approach, but I believe that if they would invite 20 best opera experts, invite them to this opera, and then have a focus group or ask them to provide feedback, he would get response to his question, pretty high quality, reliable response to his question. So indicator evaluation simply was not relevant for that case, and that's why it wasn't useful. Um, we should consider indeed different approaches to evaluation. Uh, to produce most usable results. Use of evaluation results. Any chance to improve? I hope yes. <laughs>